You will never have to worry about where your next appointment is going to come from if you watch this video in full, and I can guarantee you that, okay? I have poured months of my knowledge into actually building this video so that you don't have to worry where your next client is going to come from. My business sends thousands of cold DMs every single day across multiple different platforms, so I know a thing or two about how to write scripts that actually convert. If you take what I'm going to tell you in this video and actually apply it to your business, it's gonna change your life, and I can say that for a fact, but the sad thing is that most of you don't have the discipline to actually stick it through and watch the entire video because you're all accustomed to TikTok and YouTube shorts and you cannot hold your attention span for more than five seconds. And to that, the only thing I can say is how are you planning on building a business if you can't stick to one thing for at least an hour or however long this video lasts, okay? I don't know. But for those of you who are actually committed to building a better business and to getting more clients, let's get into it. Okay, so before we dive into all of this, I just wanna tell you that this is probably going to be the most valuable copywriting video that you can find on YouTube, on the internet in general. I've searched up for things like this. I've never been able to find anything. So I decided to put all of my knowledge into actually building this because there needs to be some education on how to actually write copy because I see way too many outreach that sucks, okay? So that's what this video is going to fix and make sure you grab a pen and a paper because this is actually going to be information that you're gonna to wanna to remember so that you can utilize it in your own copy because if you watch this and don't actually take any action on it, it's not gonna be that useful for you, okay? So let's jump right into this. Direct, direct response copywriting and systems, okay? Understanding how to write copy as an ad advertiser is the most fundamental skill that you can have, okay? Not only is this gonna help you get more clients, but it is also going to help you get better results for them. Near the end of this document, I'm gonna share some of the exact tactics and strategies that I've used to build a six-figure lead gen agency, okay? And principle number one, you cannot build a business by copying and pasting. That's why this video is important, but the reason for that is because everyone else does. And if you do the same thing as everyone else, you're gonna get the same results as everyone else, and most people are not getting very good results, okay? If everyone uses the same copy, it's gonna stop working very quickly, and getting clients is gonna be very difficult for you. So it's important that you actually understand what I'm gonna cover here. Right? What is copy and copywriting? Okay, we're gonna start off basic to build up from. So simply put, copy is the text that is used to compel someone to take a specific action. It's a form of stimulus, which is the goal of the stimulus is to get someone to do something else. Okay, it's like an like an object or a thing that gets someone to do something. Okay. So an example of this, right? The person reading the copy is and then taking the desired action is called a process, okay? So like the process, for example, of you clicking a YouTube video, right? The stimulus is the thumbnail and the title, and then you, the desired action is you clicking the video. The process is you seeing the thumbnail and you clicking the video, okay? If we put this, if we put someone through multiple different processes to achieve an ultimate desired outcome, that is what a system is, okay? Now that's not the actual definition of a system, okay? But that is the definition that we're gonna use in this video to help understand how to actually build outreach systems, okay? A stimulus or piece of copy, as we will discuss further, is a small piece of a system, okay? A system is composed of multiple processes and each process is catalyzed by a stimulus, okay? I'm basically just repeating the same thing in a different way so that more of you will actually understand what I'm saying because it's very important. So for example, for video sales letter, there are multiple different types of stimuli involved. It's not just copy, okay? So there's a play button, right? And there's a copy or the words that the person is saying in the VSL. There's visual cues, and then there's a call to action button, right? I'm sure there's more, you can probably think of more, but those are some examples of what a stimulus is. So a visual representation of a system, a system takes a human from something, turns a human from something into something else. Here's a visual representation of what this looks like in a cold calling system. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit here, right? We have our input, which is the person in the niche that we're calling, right? And then, we send the, we, we ring their phone, okay? The phone ringing is the stimulus. Now, them picking up the phone is the desired action, okay? Now, if they do that, we send, that's one process. If we do that, if they complete that, then they go to the next process where we pitch them our hook, right? That's a, that's a piece of copy is the hook, right? We're reading that. And the desired action is for them to, right? Give us permission to continue to speak, okay? And that's one process, then they go to the next process. I'm not gonna read through this whole thing, um, but then they go to the pitch, then they get interested, then you call them, call them to action, then they book the appointment, then the output is the person who booked an appointment, okay? So that's how it works. In a nutshell, right, the goal of copywriting is persuade so, to persuade someone else 
to take a certain action that gets them closer to where you want them to be and make the decisions that you want them to make, okay? So if we can convince people to do things, we can convince people to become clients, okay? That's the whole point of this. Systems are an extremely important subject that you need to succeed in direct response marketing. However, this video specifically is just covering copywriting, okay? However, you can't really copy, write copy without understanding systems. So it's important to kind of get a general understanding of what we're talking about here, right? Both are extremely important. If we know how to do one, but we don't know how to do the other, then nothing really helps, okay? If we have copy, but we don't have a system to put the copy into, it doesn't really do anything, right? And if we have a system, but we don't have any stimuli for the system, then it also doesn't do anything, right? That would be trying to like climb a ladder without the rungs in the middle. So this is what that looks like, right? So you have your system and then you have your copy and then the person climbing on the copy or like going through each piece of copy is the stimulus or the process, sorry, right? So if you took away the system and you only had the copy, how are you gonna get the person from the bottom of the ladder to the top of the ladder? You can't. If you have just the system without the copy, you also can't, they also can't get to the top. I'm not sure if that's what I just said or not, um, but you need both of them for them to get from the bottom to the top of the ladder, okay? That is our goal, is to get them from the bottom to the top. Copywriting law book. This is probably the most important part of this video, okay? If you can use the five principles that I'm about to explain here, you cannot write bad copy, okay? If you follow all of these five principles, it is physically impossible for you to write a bad piece of copy. I'm gonna go through these step by step. These are not suggestions and they should be treated as laws of nature and should be abided by every single time, right? Like the law of gravity in simple, ter in simple terms, obviously it's, this is not the law of gravity, but what goes up must come down, right? Just like copy written without these five laws executed will fail, okay? It's not like might fail, this should be bolded, okay? It will fail. I've taken the time to think about these five principles and all five of them applied correctly makes it impossible for you to write a bad piece of copy, okay? It literally makes it not possible, even if you tried to. That's how I made these, okay? Here they are. Number one, friction, okay? When you are writing direct response copy, your goal is to get a response, no shit, okay? To increase our chances of this to occur, we must make the process of responding directly to us as easy as humanly possible, therefore reducing or thereby reducing the friction of responding to your copy, okay? Pretty simple. This is fundamental and applies to thousands of different situations, but I'm going to give you a few common ways that this principle applies, okay? This list, right, um, like the, the couple examples that I'm giving you, there's infinite more, but this is just going to give you kind of an idea of what I mean by this, okay? Now put yourself in your prospect shoes. Let's say you're a busy gym owner and you are checking your emails before you drive home to see your family, but you get an intriguing email with the subject line membership question, okay? Scenario one, you open the email, it has six lines of copy, you probably started to read it already, okay? Scenario two, you see that the email has more copy than the space on your screen, you skim over it and realize it's a sales email. They're not gonna read it. They wanna go home to their family, okay? But if it's short and sweet, then they might be like, okay, fine, give this guy time. People think the first process to a cold email system, after the subject line, obviously, is the prospect reading the copy and then deciding to respond. They're wrong. It's actually them seeing the format of the copy and then deciding to read it, okay? So the front end system actually looks like this, right? So this is what people think is you just, you send them the, like your pitch and then they read it. But they actually look at the format of the email and then they choose whether or not they want to read it, right? Some people are gonna drop off here. And then they actually start to read it, okay? But they're like, if you get a long ass message and you get like a ton of them every single day, like these business owners do, they're not gonna read all of them. I cannot tell you how many times I get pitched on Facebook every single day. And all these messages are like longer than that little box that actually shows the message. And there is no chance that I'm reading any of them unless they're like super short and concise, right? Because it's just not worth my time. I can't read all of them. When your goal is to get a response of any kind, you always need to overcome mental friction because you're requiring your prospect to think. This is especially important to consider when at the beginning of an engagement with a prospect as they ascribe zero value to your conversation, okay? So maybe if someone sent me a short message, I responded and then they sent me their long pitch, then I'm already more engaged into the conversation and then I might want to reply, okay? So this means if they have 
too much, they have to spend too much mental energy thinking about whether they should reply to you or not and how they would like to reply to you. They probably just won't. Okay. And this is going to be covered more in the fifth principle. Um, but this is extremely important, right? To make it easy to reply, we need to involve as little thinking on their behalf as possible. A couple of ways that we can do this is by giving them a static number of possible responses. Okay. This is just another way that friction can be applied to make sure our copy is good. This can come in many different forms, but here are some examples. Hey, John, I just saw your page here on Insta. Do you do ceramic coating or just interior cleaning, right? This is obviously for a car detailing um, niche, okay? Why is this a good question? Because it is a close-ended question. There's only one possible answer to this question, which is whatever is true for his business. Obviously, he can lie, but like, that, would be, that wouldn't really make any sense, right? He knows this by the back of his hand. He doesn't need to think or not whether he does ceramic coating for his business because he already knows that. So he can just respond. It's easy, okay? Because he does not need to think about the answer about what he wants to say, the mental friction is reduced and the reply rates are increased. Okay, here's another example. Hey, Lucy, I love the work that you posted. Would this be the best place to ask questions regarding design jobs? Okay, so this is, right? Is this the best place to answer? Is this the best place to ask questions or is it not? There's two possible answers, and the only one that she's going to reply with is, well, probably the truth, right? You see, we're making it super easy to respond. Like I said, like I just said, they have only one way to respond, and they already know what the answer is. They'll either say, yes, this is the best place to respond or to ask, or no, it is not. Send it to my email or WhatsApp or, like, whatever, okay? Or they might just say, fuck off, but most people will not say that. Regardless of what they say, though, except for that last one, we win. We just need to get a response, okay? The whole goal is to get a response or get a response for them to actually commit to the conversation, okay? And that's just a system pointer. Here is a side-by-side -side example of how you could apply this in a sales call, right? So you could say, all right, John, after going through everything I've shown you, obviously you say it's after your pitch, what do you think, okay? Here the prospect could say a million different things. It's an open-ended question many of which would stray from the response that we need them to get to to make a buying decision, okay? The reason for that, why that isn't happening, is because there's friction. We're making it difficult for them to come up with an appropriate answer, okay? Not good. How do we avoid this? By giving them a static number of possible responses, okay? All right, John, after going everything I've shown you here, do you think this will help you get to 10K a month, right? The only possible response to that is yes or no. Their confidence level may vary. Okay, this isn't supposed to be a sales video. They might say like, yeah, I think so. Then you probably want to dive deeper into why they only think so, right? But that's not the point of this video. But it's a lot easier to go from a yes or a no than like whatever they could say if we just left it as an open-ended question, okay? Pause, okay? When I was writing this, I just received an outreach message, right? And this is why there's five laws, not just one. It follows this law that I just explained but it still sucks, okay? So let's take Mary as an example. Hello, Josh, fellow Earth inhabitant. Sorry, weird question, but can you swim? It's like, what the fuck? So like, you can you can use these principles, or this one specifically, but you can also like, be stupid as well. So this is not, this is why there's, there's multiple laws here that I have to go over, because I wanna make this bulletproof because if people like still follow this, they can obviously still make no sense. Obviously not respond to this message. Um, but the best message she's going to get is probably like a question mark. Um, I don't know. Okay. I, I, some people just like blow my mind. Okay. Principle two, <laughs> desensitization. So surgeons see open bodies every single day and it does not shock them. Okay. It's not exciting. It's just a part of their everyday life. Bill Gates makes hundreds of millions of dollars every single day. It does not face him. If your prospect sees the same outreach script every single day, which they do, okay, I'm telling you that right now, they are going to be desensitized to it. They're not going to care because they've seen it all before. If I had a dollar for every message that I received on Facebook that says, hello, Josh, I work for a company that can book you insert number of appointments here per month, I would be making more than 99% of agencies out there. Your product probably isn't so unique that you can reach out to people and tell them what you do and expect them to be interested from that, okay? The issue is that probably they've seen it a million times before, okay? This is why it's so important that your offer positioning and your scripting is unique, okay? Let's say we have 100 different emails that, we're being, that are being sent to us, okay? 
99% of them are normal text emails, but one of them has a picture of your website in it. That is instantly going to trigger something new in your prospect's brain because they have not seen it before, or at least less than this, right? The more unique you are, the more attention you will get, the more attention you get, the more money you make. Pretty simple, okay? Psychologically, human brains have adapted to conserve energy because way back when, right, if we were able to conserve more calories, more likely to survive, hence we evolved, okay? Now this trait isn't as useful, but it exists just as much, and that is why we have knee-jerk responses, okay? So when you see the same thing over and over and over again, your brain is going to conserve energy and just do the same thing that it already did all those times before, okay? It's very good at pattern recognition and does things without consulting our conscious mind. It's basically a shortcut, okay? So we can't let them take that shortcut or else we have a problem. There was a study done once on chess players. This is kind of irrelevant, but it is kind of relevant. Um, and the chess grandmaster could burn up to 6,000 calories a day just from using his conscious brain, like thinking about chess, okay? So this is like, like this is a real thing. But in summary, right? If people see that you send them a sales email, their subconscious mind will trigger the following actions, press escape, archive the email, read the next email, because they have categorized that email the same way they categorize the millions of sales emails that they have received already, right? But if you can break that pattern, you can prevent the prospect subconscious from categorizing your email as a sales pitch. If you take anything away from this presentation at all, it is that copy, copying and pasting an email script from your favorite guru on YouTube will prevent you from succeeding because every single other person is doing that. And your prospect has probably seen like an email copy that originated from like Iman Gaji like a million times. Okay. I can promise you that right now. Principle three. Okay. Perceived effort. People want to speak to humans and not robots. Can you believe it? Okay. If they believe that you are a robot, they will not respond. Or at least 99.999% of them will not. This is a pretty obvious statement. But for this list to be foolproof, I had to include it. The more effort your prospect believes that you have put in, the more they will give back to you on average, right? Obviously, it's not going to be true for every single person. And um, that is why you can never have a 100% appointment booking rate. If it looks like you copy and pasted a message with a bunch of emojis and like make it fancy or something and took no time into actually making the message specifically for them, if it looks like an ad, they're not going to respond. Okay? It needs to be personal. There are many ways you can create perceived effort, but here are a few, right? You can address the person by their name. You can speak casually and conversationally. Don't like use like sir or ma'am or like stupid shit like that. Act like you're generally, genuinely interested in the person you're speaking to. Use humor, etc. Okay, the list can go on forever and ever and ever. Um, you can be creative about this. But at the end of the day, the effort that is perceived by your prospect to go on into your copy or stimuli, the more success that you were going to see. This is important. This next part is important, okay? And I see so many people who get this wrong and it frustrates me, okay? Do not sacrifice volume for personalization. There must be a balance between the personalization of the outreach you send as well as the efficiency and the volume of your copy exposure. So this is a rule that I always go by, okay? What is the most, what is the highest level of personalization that I can achieve while sending an infinite amount of volume? That is what you need to go by, okay? You should never sacrifice volume for quality. However, you can also integrate a high amount of quality into the volume that you are sending, okay? No matter how high it is, right? There's never a circumstance in which the message needs to be like a robotic message, okay? You can still make it personal, assuming you're using software, which if you don't have the money for software, I would highly recommend getting a job and building up capital before you start a business because it's very, it's going to be faster, okay? And I can promise you that from experience, okay? Um, that's a whole nother story though. If you think that you can't personalize and send at scale, you have a false and limiting belief because I'm currently sending close to 3000 DMs per day for my clients on autopilot and they all have a high level of perceived effort, okay? If you have the most tailored message in the world but you send it to 20 people, guess what? You're not going to see your desired result. You have to make your message as personal and as conversational as possible while maintaining a high volume of messages being sent. Okay. That is a law in itself. Do not sacrifice volume. Okay. Principle number four is desire and incentive. Okay. And this is going to go back to that swimming example. Okay. 
Um, you can have the most unique offer in the world with the best position possible, written in the most straight to the point manner with a message that is super easy to respond to and has an insanely high perceived effort, but still fail. And that's why there's five principles, not three. Why? Because your prospect might not give a shit about whatever you are trying to say to them. Okay. Just like, I don't give a shit if you're asking me if I can swim or not, because there's no reason why I would want to respond to someone like that. Okay. Um, the way I wanted to write these five laws was so that it would be impossible to write bad copy. So if you said something like, I like bananas, I saw your website that your company's vision is to feed people in Africa who are starving. Do you like bananas, John? Want to buy my bananas, right? It follows the three previous laws, <laughs> but John probably doesn't give a shit about your bananas. So it's probably not going to be a, you're not probably not going to have very much success with it. It has to be something that the prospect actually cares about. Okay. I know it's straightforward and it's like no shit, but there's so many people who have terrible offers who are trying to like put a shitty offer into a, like a market that like doesn't want it. Like you cannot force something that your prospect doesn't want down their throat, right? Like it's like trying to fit like a square into a circular hole. Like it's just not going to work unless the square is like small, but that's not the point. Okay. It depends on what stage you are in the system you're in, but earlier on to build some rapport, you might just use the fact that the person might want to connect with like-minded people, right? So your like the reason for them to respond to you might not necessarily, I mean, at some point it will have to be obviously, but in the beginning stage, right? It can just be like, they might want to have a conversation with someone so then you can give that to them. Okay. And then you can also use that to increase the, uh, uh, the elevation of commitment without bringing your pitch with a trying to give him an incentive to do with your product. Okay. And that's going to be covered more later down this list, but that is something that you can use. Okay. So give the prospect what the prospect wants. Okay. It's pretty straightforward and hint. They probably don't want bananas unless you are selling to monkeys. Okay. If you're talking to a gym owner who can fill his gym really well, but has a 15% churn, Pitching him on Facebook ads and offering him 20 new members guaranteed is not going to make him want to respond. Okay. But if you pitch him on increasing LTV and retention through email and SMS marketing, he would be stupid not to respond, right? That would be an offer so good that he would feel stupid saying no, right? That's the whole goal of this, right? You have to actually give them what they want. This isn't a copywriting secret. Obviously it's more to do with offers, but if you build an offer without doing prior market research, right? As to what problem your niche in your niche actually needs to be solved. You're not going to succeed no matter how good your copy is. And that's just a fact. Give people a reason to want to respond to your message. And remember that people do things for their reason, not yours. They don't care if you want to book a call with them. They care. They're going to book a call with you if they think it's beneficial to them for them to book a call with you. Okay. Learn to understand your prospects super well, put yourself in their shoes and ask, what, why would I want to respond to this? If you have a difficult time coming up with the answer to that question, you probably need to go back to the drawing board. Okay. Principle number five, last one, escalation of commitment. I was hesitant as to whether I should include this or not, because this is not really a copy thing. This is more systems. However, if you don't actually implement this, you will fail. Okay. So I felt the need to include it. So from the title of this principle, you can probably guess what I'm about to say. You probably think I'm going to say, you need to build some rapport before trying like selling the person. I'm not saying that kind of, I kind of am saying that, um, but you don't need to sell your soul providing value to someone and taking them out to a steak dinner before you ask for a sales call. However, if you ask for the sale on the first DM, I guarantee that you will not get it. Okay. If you send someone to strike blank on the first DM and you get the sale, I will, I will match that. Okay. Like I said, this is more systems than copy itself, because what I'm basically saying is there is a time and a place for different levels of response commitment. Okay. When you send a prospect a stimulus, you are inherently asking for some type of commitment, whether it is time or whether it is money. Okay. The level of commitment that you are allowed to ask for increases the longer that the prospect is in your system for, I will give you a visual representation of how this works below. Okay. So this is what this looks like. As you can see, the amount of commitment that people are willing to give you is going to exponentially increase over the time that they spend inside of your system. Okay. And then it drops off a little bit. Um, but as we can see, right. Commitment over time increases exponentially. However, 
we can see that there are gray lines. These are individual people and the pink line is the average, okay? So not every single person is going to have the same level of commitment that are, they are willing to give up front. So some people are gonna be like over here, like if if you call them to if you call the person to action and the action threshold like is like here and you call them at like this time you're only going to get like these two guys but if you wait like this long then you're going to get all of these guys and you're still going to miss out on this guy because this guy is like stubborn right so this is why like in the long run inbound attraction and lead magnets work like way better than outbound in the long run, right? Because outbound systems only capture the percentage of people with a lower barrier to commitment. However, even if we're doing outbound, we can still increase the length of the system um, by just adding more steps to the conversation, right? And that's gonna increase the length of time that they're on this graph for, okay? But like this guy, he's probably only gonna, you're probably only gonna collect him with an inbound system, right? Because he's like way, he, he's very hesitant. He's probably been burned like three times, okay? This is not to say that you shouldn't do outbound because that is a lie, okay? However, it is important to know this because it can help us build better systems that convert higher, okay? In inbound or in outbound, okay? And the reason why like YouTube is such a good inbound system after you've consistently posted for years is because people with high commitment barriers have the opportunity to like watch like a hundred videos, right? And then once they watch a hundred videos and they spent like, almost 100 hours with you, then they'll, they'll almost certainly be at the level of commitment required to actually book a call with you and for you to be able to close them. Okay, that is how exponential growth works. Inbound leads who already received value from you for a longer period of time will capture a larger percentage of people because it also captures the people with a high barrier to commitment. Okay, in essence, this encapsulates the principle of commitment ex escalation that I'm trying to explain. Okay. If we want to go back to the latter metaphor, let's say you cold call a prospect and you say this, Hey, John, guess what? This is a cold call. Ha ha. Right. On the hook one roll the dice. Okay. You can copy this if you want. It actually works pretty well. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> well, I've been doing some digging on the internet and your social profiles really seem to hit the mark, but I've noticed that a lot of gym owners in the area are experiencing pretty high churn around February after the new year's resolution crowd dies down. We've actually got an email and SMS reactivation system that reduces churn with the ad added benefit of bringing back old customers. It's a one-time fee of four grand. Can, you, can I send the Stripe link? The prospect's going to be like, what? This guy's asking for the Stripe link and we've talked for like 30 seconds. Okay, so this is like the latter scenario, right? So you're on the roof and you want him to come to the roof. But these are the bars that you're giving him, right? He only has the cold call. He, he only has like the hook, like the pitch. And then the stripe link, it's like, how it's not possible for him to get from here to here. This is what you're asking him to do. That's not like, you, it's not physically possible. Okay. So now you might have like four rungs to the ladder, which a, like a, it might convert a small percentage of people, say, for example, with like really long legs. However, you're missing out on the greater population by skipping over the process, right? So this is like worth an inbound system. If they spend a lot of time, like on the ladder, if there's like a million different things here, like even like a midget can climb up this ladder, okay? So and this is the same thing with sending your pitch up front, right? You might have a great pitch, but there's a lot of commitment, like your pitch is all the way up here and there's nothing below. So there's a lot of commitment and only people with really long legs can actually get to this part, okay? Um, however, once they have already climbed up a few rungs of the ladder, they will be more committed to the conversation, the gap is shorter and a greater percentage of people will give you the time of day to actually hear you out. Okay, you can have the best copy in the world, but if the copy is misplaced relative to the system, you will never get what you want. Okay, this can be the strongest, the strongest ladder bar, but if it's still all the way up there and there's nothing to, for him to be able to get there with, you can't really do anything, okay? So those are the laws. Now I'm gonna go over some tactics and strategies using human tendencies and heuristics, okay? so. Before you finish a piece of copy, okay, and this is important for any script, make sure to check back to the five copywriting laws and make sure that all of them, not four of them, make sure that all five of them are in place. If they are all in place, you will not fail, okay, unless you like, unless your system sucks, okay, but that's a conversation for a different video. However, there are still additional tactics, right, that we can use by leveraging human tendencies to further improve the copy that we write, okay? So these are like the fundamentals. That we covered that we just covered those are fundamentals these are like added things that we can also add to the fundamentals to make it even better right so number one resonance the importance of resonance cannot be overstated what is resonance it is a combination of how you speak 
and what you say to convey a message that aligns with the prospect's current beliefs or the way that they see the world. Okay. A common way for people to frame resonance is speaking the prospect's language. Okay. You've probably heard that before. And if you haven't, well, now you have. Okay. For example, if we we're talking to a realtor, we don't want to say, I can help you get more clients. Instead, we might want to say, I can help you get more buyers, or you could say, this is even better. Like for the current times, I can help you get more sellers, even in the current market. Okay. So now, right, the more you know about the prospect, the more personalized these messages are getting, right? So this is part of the effort perception right? Where they see that you actually know what you're talking about. Okay. The more they're going to trust you and the more of them are going to buy from you. Okay. This is the reason why, right? The best niche is the one that you stick to for the longest period of time. It isn't fully because you can deliver the best service for them, which is true, but it's more of about, of about the fact that you can actually understand them really, really well. And that level of understanding is going to compound for the length of time that you are in that niche for. Okay. So, Let's give you an example here. Let's say you're on a sales call with a gym owner and he doesn't think that now is the best time to start marketing, okay? So this is the prospect, right? Hey man, so I like what you've got, but you know you know how it is, right? We're in January at the moment and we've got a ton of new embers because the new year's resolution thing. Maybe it would be better to contact me in like Q2. Then you could say, yeah, man, that makes sense. I mean, I, I guess I'm just a little bit concerned because of the high amount of signups in January. It, it is possible that there could be high churn in February. I mean, look, here's the way I see it, John. When you go to hit your bench max, do you normally have a spotter before you start the lift or do you wait until after it lands on your chest, right? And you don't even need to tell him anything. You just ask him the question and he's going to see your point, okay? Because, I mean, if you don't understand what I said here, like the whole point is that he understands that it's better to have the systems in place before things go bad, okay? Because if you wait till February, when everyone churns, then you're in a really shitty situation, okay? Just like if the bar is like on your neck and you don't have a spotter there, right? That's not a very good situation to be in. So if we related the prospect of being like to being safe while we work out, which he knows is important to his income being safe, okay? Now, if we were to use the same analogy to a med spa owner, they'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about, Okay. That, like it, it, it wouldn't make sense. They don't speak that language. Okay. So before you say or write anything, make that you were, make sure that you were using the prospect's language to the best of your ability. Okay. Every single thing should be interpreted or like spoken the way that your prospect would interpret it. Okay. Number two, scarcity, pretty short and simple. People tend to want things that is difficult to get or is limited in quantity. For example, if you worked with local construction companies, you might say in your copy that you only work with one business per state or per city because you wouldn't want competition between your clients, which is a very valid reason. Okay. Urgency. Urgency is pretty self-explanatory, but if it feels as if it is more beneficial to decide in the present moment, the prospect generally will do that or will have a higher likely chance, higher, higher percent chance to do so. Going back to the same construction example, if you told a business owner that you were already in talks with another construction company nearby, and you just wanted to give them one more opportunity, right? That might create some urgency because they have to say yes, or they're not going to have the opportunity to work with you. And they're going to lose customers to their competition, neither of which those things they want, or at least the last one they definitely don't want, right? Now, big warning here, okay? And I have to mention this, unfortunately, because this is a big thing in the industry, and sadly, okay? Don't lie. Do not create fake urgency, right? Because 90% of the time, people are going to see right through you. You're going to lose all of your trust, which is like, if they don't trust you, they're not going to buy from you, okay? And it's going to, it's one. there's a 100% chance of it hurting your credibility and your reputation. And you can always make more money, but you can never buy back your reputation, okay? So, right, and also, this is also very important, okay? Don't say it in a way where it's obvious that you are only saying it to create urgency, okay? Because people know how urgency works and they will also know when you are using it for the sake of persuasion, okay? If you are saying, I'm only taking on one more sales call until the end of the quarter, people are gonna know it's bullshit because if that were the case, you would not be reaching out to them in the first place, okay? You don't do cold outreach if you can't take on any more clients or at least most people don't. Use it indirectly, be smart about it. Same thing applies to scarcity, okay? So don't lie about scarcity. Don't say like, I'm only taking on one more client, 
like there's only there's only one spot available it's like you wouldn't be reaching out to me right people would be coming to you if that were the case okay curiosity people have a desire to uncover what is hidden to learn what they do not this tendency is extremely important when it comes to booking an appointment okay if you give them your service in detail your price and your strategies all before the call they will have no reason to book as they feel they understand the whole picture and they're going to make a decision without the call and the answer is 99.999 percent of the chance going to be no and this can be used in many different ways but that is just a very common example okay number five is the ego bias okay people think they are the best they think they know everything they think they're always right okay you can take advantage of this in many different ways but here are two First one is based on the fact that they may have limiting beliefs, right? That would make it irrational for them to buy or rational for them not to buy. Okay. That is a problem. But the problem is that you cannot tell them that their in beliefs are that their beliefs are wrong. Okay. If you tell a prospect that they are wrong, you have all automatically lost the sale. It doesn't matter what you say after that. If you tell them that they're wrong, they're not going to like you. Okay. What you need to do is ask a thought provoking question that leads to them convincing themselves that a different belief is the case. So this kind of goes back to the gym example, right? We just ask them the question, do you have a spotter before you start your lift? Okay. We didn't need to tell him anything to change his belief. We asked him a question and then he he came to the conclusion that his belief was wrong and our belief was right. If you're talking to a landscaper about running Facebook ads for them and they say Facebook ads don't work, do not tell them. Yes, they do. I can show you. Okay that is like you've lost the sale okay you're probably right i mean you are right facebook ads do work um but it doesn't matter if you're right and you're broke okay i would rather be wrong and not broke but that's up to you okay their ego is going to flare up as soon as you say that and they're just going to argue with you okay instead say interesting john um ha have you run facebook ads before and then he's going to say yes or no if he says yeah i ran ad once and got no clients then respond with, oh, interesting. How, how long have you practiced running ads for? And he might say, oh, I only did it for three weeks. And then you can say, oh, interesting. Um, well, let me ask you this. If I tried running a landscaping business for like three, maybe four weeks, do you, do you think I would do very well? Okay, that's a question, by the way. Then he'll say no and come to the conclusion on his own, with your help, obviously, that his ads were unprofitable for the reason that he wasn't good at running ads. Now, I want to say something about this because... You can still say the same shit and have not success or not have success, right? If you say, have you run Facebook ads before? That is like the same thing as what I said before, okay? Your tonality is extremely important. If you sound like an asshole, it doesn't matter if you're asking the question, okay? You actually have to ask with a curious tone, like you're actually interested in like his situation, whether he actually has run ads before, okay? Don't say it like you're trying to prove a point, okay? Because people have egos. The second way that you can utilize, utilize this is by stroking their ego, okay? One of my old cold call scripts where I was calling gyms for a client was something like this. Like, this is the pitch, by the way, okay? Great, John. So, I, I mean, I just, I just saw your gym on Facebook, and I gotta be honest, I love the facility. So, we've actually noticed in the market that the most popular gyms are normally the ones who have the biggest name and not necessarily the best facility. The reason why we started our company was because we believe that the gyms in our city should be re rewarded on their merit and not by their brand name, right? So, we are just feeding music to the prospect's ears here because everyone thinks that competition is unfair, that they have the best gym, but they don't have the big brand, right? They all have massive egos, okay? So they think they're the best, and the reason why they are not at the level as the big gyms is because they don't have a big name, okay? And it's, like, kind of true, but also, like, not everyone has the best facility, okay? But they all think they do. So we have to basically confirm their beliefs, and then they will like us more, and they will be more open to hearing us out. Because if we tell them this, and we also tell them to book a call, right, they'll be more likely to listen to us because they actually believe that we know what we're talking about because we just told him something that he thinks is true, right? So number six, risk aversion. People have a natural tendency to avoid risk and stick with the status quo. This can make it difficult to get humans to take a desired action and do the things that we want them to do. However, if we frame our solution as the less risky option and the status quo as the more risky option, we can create massive leverage, okay? So if you're on a sales call, and you can tell that the only objection that your prospect has is fear. You can tell them, look, 
hey, I know this is scary and I know it feels like you're taking a huge risk here, but I mean, is one grand a month more risky than not ever being able to have that freedom that you said you wanted, right? So now we're telling them that sticking with the status quo is more risky, okay? Working with us is the safer option, okay? And note that I asked this as a question. I'm not telling them like, it's way more safer to work with me. That's not grammatically correct, but like, you're not saying that, right? You have to ask it. They have to come to the conclusion on their own. You cannot tell them anything, right? They have to come up with it themselves. If you're trying to convince someone to hop on a sales call, they might feel that they are risking 30 minutes of their time, but the biggest risk is to miss out on the opportunity that you were convinced could change their life and their business, okay? And you have to you have to sell them on that conviction that you have that you might be able to change their life, okay? Number seven, damaging ambitions. If you say you are bad at something, it automatically gives you more trustworthiness because if you were a liar, you would not speak poorly about yourself. What we can do that with what we can do with that is tell them the truth and let them know that we suck at some things, but we are incredible at other things, okay? If you do this, prospects will tend to have more conviction that you are incredible at the things that you are, that you say you're good at, right? So my old outreach scripts were centered around the fact that I didn't know how to run Facebook ads, I couldn't learn SEO to save my life, but I was damn good at appointment booking, okay? And if I just said I was good at appointment booking, right, most people think that's bullshit because everyone and their mother says they're good at booking appointments and like none of them are. But saying it like this gave them a lot more conviction that I was telling the truth because I also said something bad about myself, okay? It's weird how this works, but it does. I've tested it a million times. You can search it up. Um, like, it's a thing, okay? If you work with lawyers and you tell them, hey, look, I wish I could do what you do and I wish I was smart enough and like to get through law school and solve these huge cases for people. And like, I'm not able to do that, right? But I can write you damn good Google ads, right? So now not only, I mean, this is like kind of a two in one here, right? You're getting an extra deal where you're also stroking their ego and you're saying that you can't do what they do, right? You're not smart enough to do what they do, but you do know how to write really good Google ads, okay? They're gonna have a lot more conviction in the fact that you can actually write good Google ads. The amount of credibility that you can get from a statement like that is unparalleled. And I wanted to save this for the last tendency that I'm sharing, because it's probably one of the best, and the people without the focus to go through the whole document with me probably don't deserve access to the best info, okay? So, I hope this is all useful, and I hope it helps you have an understanding of how you can create insane copy for your systems, book a shit ton more appointments, and close way more sales than you currently are. If this video was useful to you at all, make sure to subscribe so that YouTube recommends more videos like this so that you can get more information to actually build your business and scale it to the next level, okay? Every single Saturday, I do live calls with my community on Facebook and we go over your individual outreach scripts and I help you improve them so that you can get more sales and sign more clients. It's completely free. You can join. There's a link in the description, okay? I'm not here to sell you anything. Um, so those are the only two things that I ask from you is to join the Facebook group and subscribe to the channel so that I can help you out even more, okay? If you wanna send me a DM, um, I'll be more than happy to go over your outreach scripts personally. Um, and that's pretty much all I wanted to say, okay? So I hope you have a fantastic day, but make sure to take this knowledge, use it, and get to fucking work.